Caroline, it's really great to have you. Thank you so much for for being here. I really appreciate. I know how busy you are. Uh, I'm. I know all the students here are are very excited to to hear from you. And so I'll just briefly introduce you to the students. Uh, okay. Uh, in case they they live uh, in a cave or something uh, uh, in the last couple of years. So Caroline Bertozzi is the auntie and Robert M. Bass Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences and professor by courtesy of Chemical and Systems Biology and Radiology. She is also the Baker Family Director of Stanford ChemH, the Chemistry, Engineering and Medicine for Human Health uh, Interdisciplinary Institute. Now, Professor Bertozzi's research spans the disciplines of chemistry and biology with an emphasis on the study of cell surface sugars and their importance to human health and disease. She is recognized for creating a new field, bioorthogonal chemistry, a class of chemical reactions compatible with living systems that enable molecular imaging and drug targeting. Her lab develops chemical tools to study diseases such as cancer, inflammation, tuberculosis, and COVID-19. Several of the technologies developed in the Bertozzi lab have been adapted for commercial use, and Caroline is actively engaged with many biotechnology startups. She co-founded Redwood Bioscience, Enable Biosciences, Paleon Pharmaceutical, Intervent Bio, Olilax Bio, Gray Science LLC, and Lysia Therapeutics, she is also a member of the board of directors of Lilly. Now, Caroline is the co-recipient of the 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the development of click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. She is also a 1999 MacArthur Fellow and has been selected to the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has received numerous other prizes, including the Lamson MIT Prize, the Heinrich Wieland Prize, the ACS Award in Pure Chemistry, and the Chemistry of the Future Solvay Prize, among many other awards. So, Caroline, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, and thank you so much for your flexibility in allowing me to record this session with you. Oh, um, and, yeah. and to the audience of students, thank you so much for your patience, and I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Wonderful. So, you know, bef before we get into your scientific your scientific breakthroughs, I, I kind of noticed something unusually cool uh, on your bio. When you were in college, you played in a rock band. Uh, I recall, I, I think you were on the keyboard. The lead guitarist became a famous musician. Can you tell us about this experience? <laughs> Well, first of all, you're right. That's by far the coolest thing on my CV. And that was back when I was, you know, in like a sophomore in college. And I've been sort of my coolness has gone pretty much down ever since then. But um, my peak of coolness was when I got to play with Tom Morello, who later formed a very famous band, Rage Against the Machine. And I think they were just inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Amazing. And um, But back in college, when Tom was just a teenager, still a brilliant guitar playing uh, musician who was also a composer, uh, he recruited me to play in his band. And so for about a year, we did gigs around, you know, the kind of Northeast college scene. And we played some of his original music. And so that was my big brush with fame. Amazing. Did, did did he call to congratulate you when you won the Nobel Prize? He tweeted, even better. <laughs> we follow each other on Twitter, and uh, he was one of the first people to tweet me a little congratulations. And I think that his tweet got like way more attention than any tweet that has ever come from myself. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I, com I completely see that. So, how, you know, how, how did you get into science in general and into organic chemistry uh, in particular? Well, I, I, I didn't discover organic chemistry until I was in college because, you know, that's typically the first time a person gets exposed to that subject. It didn't really come up when I was in high school. So I didn't really think at all about organic chemistry prior to that sophomore year of college. I don't think I really thought much about a science career um, before that either, even though I grew up in a science family. So it wasn't like such a strange concept to be a science major, but I didn't really think of myself as being like really oriented on science. 
Uh, instead, I went to college with um, not much of an idea about what I would study, but I thought maybe I could be a pre-med because it seemed like a, a practical thing to do and to prepare yourself for. And my parents were encouraging of that. Anyway, so I took organic chemistry because it was a requirement of the pre-med major and for no other reason. And unexpectedly, I really felt a, a kinship with the subject. That's very nice. And uh, and subsequently, uh, uh, f- fast forward a couple of years later, you created a new field in chemistry, bio-orthogonal chemistry. C- can you tell us a bit about the field and how did you, how did it come about, uh, its history a little bit? Yeah. Well, maybe I should start by giving you, a de- uh, you and, and the students a, a definition for bio-orthogonal chemistry. And if you break the work down, uh, it literally is chemistry that is orthogonal to biology, which means not interacting with and not interfering with. So we do chemistry where we have two things, we put them together, and it can be in like a very complex biological setting, like even inside a laboratory animal or nowadays a human patient. And these two chemicals will ignore everything in that biological setting. They won't react with any biological molecule, but when they see each other, boom, they're a perfect match and they react. uh, And some people will say they click together. And that's a term sometimes that's used to describe this chemistry. Um, And and that type of chemistry really didn't exist um, until we started to invent these reactions starting back in the late 1990s. Um, As for why a person would think to invent chemistry that you can do in a living biological system, in the early days, we were motivated by a very practical need. And it was a need in the field of glycobiology. So another term I can define for the students here. So, So glycobiology is the study of the biology of complex carbohydrates. And glyco as a prefix, a Greek prefix means sugar. So it's literally the study of the biology of sugars. And that's an area of biology I became interested in, in graduate school and then in my postdoc. And when I started my first independent job, um, I had an interest in, in developing a technology to image sugars. And sugars reside on the surfaces of all of our cells. So we wanted to image the sugars on our cells and look at how they change in diseases. But there really weren't any technologies for molecular imaging of sugars at that time. And we came up with an idea for how to image the sugars, but it required the ability to do chemistry in the biological setting. And we didn't have those chemistries. So originally, we invented the chemistry for this particular application in imaging. But then we quickly realized that the chemistry could be quite useful for a lot of different types of biology outside of glycobiology. And then the field kind of picked up on it and it became you know, thought of as a really useful tool for biological research. It's great, incredible. So, so, so let's, let's talk a bit about how, how your discoveries uh, and the field you created uh, helped develop new medicines and new tools to improve human health. So here is, so here is my, for, forgive my low level of understanding of how your research helps cure cancer, but here is my understanding, something like that. So immune cells, they look for cancer cells, and when they find them, they try to kill them. But you find that oftentimes sugars called dialic acids start to coat the cancer cells in a way that mislead the immune cells to miss the cancer cells altogether. And so you somehow magically found ways around this problem. So you know, can, can you tell us uh, more about this? Yes. Um, I just put a little something in the chat. I don't know if the chat gets recorded. I will make sure that I will make sure that they get it. Okay. So for the students in the audience, the sugar that uh, Ron has mentioned is called sialic acid. And we have come to think of this particular sugar as being immune suppressive when it is all over the surface of our cells. And you're right. Uh, we, we were working on understanding why that is. And we discovered a particular pathway that these sialic acids use to basically deliver a message to immune cells that everything is fine and the immune cells should just walk away and and don't kill. Uh, And so a cancer can exploit sialic acids to hide from the immune system, to send immune cells away and to live another day. And that of course can promote disease. So um, we actually used bioorthogonal chemistry early on 
as a tool to, to image the sialic acids. So we could see that they were overpopulated on cancers compared to normal tissue. Then later, you know, fast forward maybe 10 more years, once we understood the biology, we used bioorthogonal chemistry in a different way, which was to literally construct a new type of cancer immune therapy. And what we did was we chemically connected an enzyme called a sialidase, which cuts the sialic acids off of our cell surface. And, and we connected it using that chemistry to an antibody that targets the surface of a cancer cell. It's amazing. So, so yeah. first, I apologize for uh, uh, mispronouncing the name of the sialic acid, but That's okay. uh, <laughs> but uh, so so I should I can think about it as something like, uh, well, the immune system goes around look for this sugar, look for the cancer, but the sialic acid is incredibly sweet. So, like, he's like, oh, that that feels like it's okay over here, and yeah. you develop this thing to basically. Uh, Sh almost like shave this kind of like uh, this sugar so that the the, the Im immune system can detect the actual cancer is that is that roughly that's exactly right that's right in fact when i give a scientific talk on these new immune therapies i show a cartoon of a lawnmower driving around on the cell and <laughs> mowing the grass off of it and and the grass are the sialic acids and and as soon as a cancer cell has been stripped of its sialic acids, now the immune system can see that it's a it's a, a diseased cell, and immune cells will literally just like fire bullets at it and kill it. Incredible, and and so you mentioned you know the ability to be performed inside humans. So what what is the state of bioorthogonal chemistry and its ability to be performed inside humans nowadays? Well, that's happening. Um, the first, there, there's a, a startup company, a fairly new biotech company in the Bay Area that was the very first company to perform a bioorthogonal reaction in the body of a cancer patient. And their particular application is to target a chemotherapy drug specifically to tumor tissue without having that chemotherapy drug damage the healthy tissue. And, and if anyone is interested in looking up more about that company. Um, they're called Shasky Pharmaceuticals. Uh, I put that in the chat. I will, I will, and I will link, I will link the, the, so this is, it's, so it's potentially like revolutionary, this technology, right? Yeah. And in fact, they completed their first phase one study last year, showing that putting the chemicals into a person is totally safe and that the chemicals react with each other inside the body of the person in a way that's totally safe. And now they're enrolling patients in a phase two clinical study to see if their approach will actually benefit patients. And the cancer that they're working on is called soft tissue sarcoma. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to treat otherwise. That's, that's, really, that's really amazing. So, so, you know, as we, you know, so you, you didn't just, you know, come up with a scientific research to study that, but you also started a number of biotech companies. And as you know, we just heard you are involved with, with, with some of them, uh, you started them, you know, with the idea, I guess, of help bring your health improvements, uh, uh, you know, that your research finds to the real world. So, you, you know, can, can you tell, tell us a bit like what motivated you to do this and how did you enter the startup space from academia and how, how was that experience for you? It's been really rewarding. Um, I, I have found that um, if you want to take the discoveries from your laboratory and push them a little further towards benefiting human patients, um, maybe the most efficient way to do that is to start a company outside of the academic walls and raise money to support the drug development um, from private investment firms or from partnerships with big pharmaceutical companies. So right now I'm actually working on company number 12. <laughs> so this will be like an Very even cool. for me. I started thinking about this pretty early on in my academic career. Um, the very first company I co-founded as part of a team was back in around 1999. And I was just an assistant professor at the time. And I joined forces with my former postdoc advisor from UC San Francisco. We did a company together. And that's when I, I really enjoyed it. I, I discovered that I actually find it really fun and rewarding, even though it can be a lot of work and also very frustrating since, you know, I think anyone in the drug development business knows there's a very high failure rate. 
And most companies that launch with really great ideas, you know, never manage to get across the finish line and make an actual drug. It's, it's really hard, but I've given it a go now several times. And um, every time I start a new company, I learn something new. And it's very, for me, it's been very much kind of learn on the job and learn as I go. And I've had excellent mentors who've given me advice on how to do this early on at UC Berkeley and, and especially at Stanford. Stanford is a very sophisticated institute when it comes to doing startup companies as a faculty member. So there's plenty of people who've done this very successfully that I am able to model myself on. You want to tell us about one of those companies, like one of, one of the 12 that uh, <laughs> what, what was he trying to achieve and uh, something about it? Sure. Well, so you asked about the the lawnmowers, right? The, the Cialidase yep. antibody conjugates that we made originally with bioorthogonal chemistry. And, and that we spun out into a company called Pallion Pharmaceuticals. And I'll put that in the chat since these are all words people have not um, heard all of, it, all of it will get to the students. Okay, here's Pallion Pharmaceuticals. So Pallion is located out in Waltham, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston. And Pallion is making these Cialidase antibody chimeric molecules. And they already have put one of them into a phase one study, and it's now just enrolling in a phase two study. So, so that is, is you know, potentially a new way to treat cancer. Um, another company that's a little earlier in its stage and has not yet put a molecule into human clinical testing, but is, is getting there is, uh, you mentioned this one, it's called Lycia Therapeutics. And Lycia um, is a Bay Area company. We are located up in South San Francisco, like so many other biotech companies. Uh, Lycia is based on a totally different type of technology. And it's what we call a lysosome targeting chimera. And the abbreviation that we use is a LITAC. So LITAC is a new therapeutic modality. And, and what these molecules do is you, you put them in the human body, they will bind to a protein that is, is disease causing, and they will literally drag that protein kicking and screaming into the cells. And that protein gets degraded by an organelle within the cell that's called the lysosome. So it's a way of literally like targeting proteins and, and, and causing them to get destroyed. And we're pretty excited about this as a new type of therapeutic approach. So it, so, it sounds incredible, I have to say. Now, you know, so how, how, is, how is the experience of founding a company complementing or complicating your, your experience as a researcher? I have found it to be very synergistic, actually. Um, you know, when, when an academic faculty member launches a company based on work from their lab, they have to be a little careful, um, especially if, if students or postdocs from the lab end up leaving, you know, Stanford and joining the company as full-time employees, and, and they have a lot of knowledge that they take with them to the company. So that's of great benefit to the company because they are the experts in the technology. They, they developed it while they were in my lab, but we have to be careful to make sure that the work that continues in my lab is independent of the company and that there's no what we call conflicts of interest. So I think as long as we manage those potential conflicts of interest and, and have a nice, clear, bright line between the academic work and the company work, I think it's really mutually beneficial. The company can leverage the knowledge from my lab and develop the drug using people who were trained, you know, in the best, most perfect way to, to progress that technology. Uh, at the same time, I feel very fulfilled because we didn't just publish a paper based on the science. We did more than that. We tried to move it towards the benefit for patient. And then, you know, down the line, if if the stars align and we are very lucky and, and the technology succeeds and the company is profitable, some of the, you know, proceeds, some of the revenue that the company would earn would come back to Stanford because Stanford actually owns the patents on which that technology was based by virtue of it having been developed at Stanford in my lab. So it really is a mutually beneficial two-way street between academic founders, academic institutions, and, and then the private companies that launch out of those institutions, as long as you manage all the conflicts. You've had so much success in your career, uh, but can you maybe share with us a, a moment of frustration or a research projects of yours that failed and, and what did you learn from the experience? How much time do we have? <laughs> 
because I think we all know that the failures, quote unquote, failures, they outnumber the successes by usually about an order of magnitude. Um, and failure, I put in quotes because, um, you know, failures in, in research generally are really, it's not really a failure so much as, you know, maybe we had a hypothesis and we did experiments to test the hypothesis and we were wrong and our experiments and the data go against the hypothesis and we have to revise the hypothesis. And sometimes people find, find that to be frustrating. They might call it a failure, but it's just part of the learning experience. And, and there's no way that you can get to what you would call a success if you haven't already had all the learning from those failures, right? So right. there's plenty of failures. And, and I could even take you back to my PhD training years. Um, when I, I like to, I actually have a slide deck that I show, which is my failure CV. You know, all the failures, it's long. The unpublished papers. <laughs> and, and it starts in grad school with the papers that I published. And, and if you looked at my CV from grad school, you might think, oh, that was a pretty successful PhD. I, I co-authored 10 research articles that were published in scientific journals. That, that's a lot for a PhD. And I was pretty proud of that. But the truth is, every sing literally every single one of those publications was rejected by at least one, sometimes two or three other journals before it got published. And you don't see that on my CV, but, but that's really the, the backstory. And likewise, you know, when you read a, a scientific publication from my lab that looks like, wow, a moment of celebration, you can absolutely be sure that the people who are the authors on that paper failed and failed and failed and failed for years before we finally converged on a story that we think held water and that the data supported and then we published it. Uh, but sometimes that publication is actually a consolation prize for a project that really didn't work, you know, <laughs> that had a different focus. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that that's how you succeed as a scientist is you follow the data, you let go of wrong hypotheses, you you know embrace new hypotheses, and instead of you know feeling bad about what you didn't get or what didn't work, you try to celebrate what you do have and what does work, and and that is success. So, so this is a you know you, you touched on this a little bit. Maybe I can, if you don't mind, I'll follow up. You know, an experiment you know that didn't work. You know, according to plan, is is one form of failure. There is also the failure, let's say, to publish one's papers or a graduate student stressing about graduating on time when an experiment doesn't yeah. go according to plan. Like, do, do you have advice for, for young researchers dealing with this kind of career concerns and, and time pressures and stuff like that, which is at some level against the long-term science uh, projects that take so long and so on? That's right. There are a lot of like internal tensions and frictions in science. Uh, because it is so unpredictable and it's so much of it is really not in your control and you do the best you can, right. To have the best ideas and flesh out the ideas and plan the experiments and do them carefully. But at the end of the day, you're trying to learn something that is unknown and inherently that is risky and to failures and, you know, just wrong hypotheses. And, and, and that's the process that's inherent to the process. Yet at the same time, there are some practical issues. A grad student can't spend forever in grad school and you don't, I don't want them to, and they certainly don't want to. There's a clock and they need to finish their degree and move on and find a job. And sometimes the research project they're pursuing is not cooperating with their timeline. And, and that's a tension. And I think, in fact, that's one of the most important components of my job is, is to be able to look at the situation look at the project, the progress, the successes, the failures, the timelines, and, and the student's personality and disposition, and try to guide them in a way so that they can be productive in a reasonable time frame on something that they find exciting and important. And if things are going south for them, I need to pull them off the cliff and reorient them in a direction that I think will lead to more happiness and success. So, so that's incumbent on me to help figure that out for each person. But you're right. It, it, you know, getting through graduate school, postdoc, employment, and just being successful as a scientist is, you know, on the one hand, like the days are long, but the years are short in, in a funny way. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, receiving the Nobel Prize is, of course, a huge honor. Uh, it is also an opportunity to put the spotlight uh, on a field of inquiry and on the work of your postdocs and graduate students. What is a current work led by your students that you are particularly excited about? 
Oh, there's so many. Well, I have a, a lab full of great people. I'm, I'm very blessed. You know, I've got something like 25 coworkers right now, um, half and half grad students and postdocs and some staff as well. They are working on some really exciting projects. For example, um, I mentioned the lawnmower therapeutic idea where we take this sialidase enzyme and park it on the cancer cell and mow the lawn. Well, we have now the kind of next generation version of the landscaping therapeutic as we call them, but this one acts more like a chainsaw. It, it's, a, it's a different enzyme that kind of cuts the trees off the surface of the cell. And the sialic acids are like the leaves, but they're, the leaves are on these particular trees. And we're gonna see what happens when we just take the whole tree off. So that's fun and, and that's ongoing work. Um, we also have a project that um, is in, in a totally different area of science focused not on cancer, but rather on mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is a bacterial infection that causes tuberculosis or TB as it might be commonly understood. And that is a disease I've been working on now for more than 20 years. Um, it is the single most deadly human pathogen in the world. Um, it's been with us since ancient times. We've been trying to figure out how to cure it, how to vaccinate against it for a century and pretty much failed. So it, it is an ongoing global health crisis that has frustrated scientists for a millennium essentially. And we are trying to make a contribution in that space as well. And I'm, and I'm excited about some recent work we've done towards a point of care diagnostics for TB, make it easier to diagnose like who has TB, is the TB drug resistant TB? And if so, how are we going to treat it? Just make better decisions about TB in the field. You have been recognized for chemistry that empowers biology. Are there other fields that chemistry is improving? And in general, like what do you see as the future of chemistry? What a great question. So I am of the mind that chemistry powers all fields in some way. It, it is really, we, in fact, we often refer to chemistry as the central science. That's term has been around in my entirety of my lifetime anyways. And that's because chemistry is the study of molecules and matter. So any type of science that involves molecules or matter of any type is going to leverage advances in chemistry. So for example, energy science really centers on chemistry, right? How do you make better batteries that last longer that maybe take their energy from sunlight? All of that is a chemistry problem. Chemistry is absolutely central for sustainability. How do we clear, how do we clean the air? How do we clean the water? That's a chemistry problem and there'll be chemical solutions. How do we degrade all of the plastics contaminating our environment and convert them to benign molecules that don't harm the environment. So that is a chemistry problem. And of course, medicine, you know, which is where my focus lies. All medicines come from chemistry, ultimately, they're, they're molecules. So you'd be hard pressed to find an area of import to humanity that doesn't somehow rely on chemistry. Amazing. Now, you, you are only the eighth, I think, woman to win the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And when you first started, academic departments in the sciences had very few women. Uh, were you worried about it when you started your academic career? And how, how was your experience like on that dimension? Well, yes. I mean, I was um, in an even more stark minority than I am now. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I started my PhD, this is 1988. And at that time, a typical chemistry PhD program in the US would have maybe 10% women per class. So for me, what that meant is, you know, coming into UC Berkeley in 1988 uh, as a grad student in chemistry, maybe 50 students in the class, it was a big program, but, you know, maybe five women. And the women had a pretty high attrition rate. So, so th that, that small single digit number of women would dwindle, you know, as the years went by. And, and even fewer would ultimately graduate with a PhD. And, and when you're when you're that minoritized, um, it's a weird, it, it's weird, you know? It, it's like the stories of any woman who walks into the all-male boardroom, the all-male locker room, the all-male military, you know, infantry. Uh, and, and that's what it was like to be a chemistry PhD student. And I was the only woman in my lab in grad school for pretty much five years. Over time, these numbers have, increased. And, and by the time I actually started my faculty position, also at Berkeley, which was now maybe eight years later, um, 
the percentage of women had creeped up and was more like maybe 30%. And, and nowadays, you know, in 2023, I think it's almost 50, 50. I mean, it's, it's approached parity. So, so the culture has changed, you know, the, the, the vibe in chemistry departments has changed. Um, the faculties have not changed so much. Um, the numbers are increasing, but they are increasing at a slower pace compared to the student bodies. So there's still, you know, problems with attrition of women between the training experience and the choice to pursue an academic career. So th there's work to do, but, but it definitely feels a little bit more normal now than it did back then. So given this, what advice do you have for young women considering sciences and considering an academic career nowadays? Oh, it's a great career choice. Um, if, if a woman is contemplating that, I would encourage them because, you know, a career in the sciences opens so many doors for you. You know, it certainly has for me. Um, you know, I, I went into academia originally because I, I love to work with students. I like to teach. Uh, I like to be at the leading edge of discovery and have the freedom and flexibility that academia provides. What I didn't understand early on, but now I get it, is, is an academic career allows me to have a portal into lots of other worlds as well. So we already talked about starting companies, right? So I can exercise you know, my interests in entrepreneurship and I've learned a lot about the pharmaceutical business and the biotech business. I can contribute to scientific publishing, right? So, so I'm the editor in chief of a journal with the American Chemical Society and that gives me a way to sort of contribute to the community of chemistry through publishing and science communication. Um, I could, if I wanted to, become involved in government policy making and advising. And, you know, of course, I teach students. I, I could write books if I wanted to, educational books or whatever. So, so I have a lot of governance over my time. And I have been able to put myself in settings where I can learn about other sectors of other businesses, other industries, with my foot still grounded in my day job, you know, as a professor at Stanford. Uh, so that's my story, and 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 I have found it to be very rewarding. But but with a science education and a science degree, there's like a ton of opportunities. And I actually have a PowerPoint slide with logos of all the places that my trainees have gone to work, and you know about a third of them are universities and colleges, but two thirds of them are companies, government agencies, law firms, consulting agencies. I even have a former grad student who works for the CIA. And I can't tell you what she does there. Or I'd have to. Kill you, <laughs> you can tell me. Her, she kill me yes. <laughs> yeah, her her degree in chemistry opened that door for her. This is amazing. So 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 maybe so maybe that, that's a, uh, you know. So finally, maybe I'll ask you a last question of of what advice do you have for young undergraduate students interested in chemistry or in biochemistry? Uh, 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 what advice do you have for them of how to to best prepare themselves and what, how to pursue such career? Well, if, if they've already chosen to be a chemistry or a biochemistry student, they're halfway there because just making that choice is a certain commitment. Um, one thing I can tell you is when I was an undergraduate, I, you know, when you start out in a major, you have to take a lot of like big introductory service courses, you general chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, introductory physics and math and so on and so forth. And some of these classes, you know, are, are pretty challenging and stressful and okay, boring there i said it and um and 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 sometimes students because of their early experiences in those kind of big introductory courses in college you know they kind of get turned off and then they bail out and and i would say don't bail out because the, your experience in these big intro courses is very far removed from what life as a practicing scientist is actually like uh the way that i analogize it is like people who really enjoy playing a sport, you know, who are good at it, whether it's on the tennis court or a football field or the softball field, those people are good at their sport and enjoy it because they ran five miles three times a week. They did a hundred sit-ups and a hundred push-ups every morning. And, and they had to do some boring stuff, right. To have the muscles, right. And the, and the agility to do the fun stuff. And so those introductory courses that you're taking maybe now, even at Stanford, um, might be, they, they might feel like push-ups and sit-ups and, and running and sprints and stuff. Um, but that's just how you build the muscles, right? The real show is yet to come. So hang in there because it does get fun. Professor Carolyn Bertozzi, thank you so much for an incredibly inspiring conversation. Thank you so much for having me.